Most people who are in echocardiography actually hate diastolic dysfunction. Somehow I can actually understand. Why? Well, it's a very complex issue with a complex physiology behind it and it's not possible to directly see diastolic dysfunction. You can see the contractility in a 2D image, but it's very difficult to see how the ventricle is actually relaxing. In this chapter, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you some basic background on the physiology of diastolic dysfunction. I'd like to show you why it's important to assess diastolic dysfunction which modalities we use, but most importantly, I would like to give you a very simple approach on how to assess patients. I think it's very important to understand that diastole is closely linked to systolic function. For example, every patient who has systolic dysfunction also has diastolic dysfunction. In addition, diastole is not only a passive process, but also an active process. But first, before we go on, I would like to discuss when diastole actually occurs. Diastole is defined as the time interval between aortic valve closure and mitral valve closure. In the ECG, diastole occurs between the T wave and the onset of the QRS complex. Diastole consists of several components. The isovolumetric relaxation time, which is defined as the time between the aortic valve closure and the mitral valve opening. Rapid early or passive left ventricular filling, diastasis, and finally late left ventricular filling which correlates with atrial contraction. This diagram which resembles a Doppler tracing which records the velocity across the aortic valve and the mitral valve shows you when the different time intervals actually occur. Systole is followed by the isovolumetric relaxation time, then we have early rapid ventricular filling which is followed by diastasis where no filling occurs and then finally we have atrial contraction which leads to active filling of the left ventricle. This is then followed by the pre-ejection period and systole again. In patients who have a high heart rate we have more fusion of the rapid early filling and the late filling therefore in these patients we do not necessarily have to have the phase of diastasis. How do we measure these intervals with echocardiography? To measure diastolic intervals, we need a good mitral inflow signal. We'll try to record one now from our patient here. Okay, so this is okay. So what we see nicely here is we have E wave and the A wave. And the first thing we can measure now is the duration of diastole, which starts right here at the beginning of the signal and ends right here at the end. So we have 649 milliseconds for the diastolic filling time, so the duration of diastole. The next thing we can do is we can look at obviously also the duration of systole and the duration of the heart cycle. So we can relate the duration of diastole percent-wise to the duration of the heart cycle. So how much percent of the heart cycle is diastole? In our case you can see that uh, our patient has far above 50% of diastolic filling percentage. The next thing that you can measure in such patients is the isovolemic relaxation time. To do that, you need to also get an LVUT outflow signal. And to do that, you need either a five-chamber view or a three-chamber view where you can see the LVOT. And then you place the signal right here in the LVOT, close to the mitral valve. And then you have both signals. You have the aortic signal here, the outflow signal, and the beginning at least of the mitral inflow signal. And the duration between these two signals is the so-called isovolumetric relaxation time. So the end here to the beginning right here. This would be the isovolumetric relaxation time. But before we go into detail on how to quantify and measure diastolic function, I want to show you what diastolic function actually is. In most cases, what we're measuring is actually filling pressure. So diastolic function is closely related to filling pressures. Diastolic function is influenced by many factors such as the geometry of the left ventricle, if the synchrony, for example, is present, 
preload of the ventricle, active myocardial relaxation, the stiffness of the pericardium, the left atrium, pulmonary veins, and the mitral valve, heart rate, and the compliance of the left ventricle. So in reality, no matter what the interplay between all the different factors is, what we measure with echocardiography ultimately, in most cases at least, is left ventricular filling pressure. With echocardiography, there are numerous different modalities with which we can actually measure diastolic function. Most commonly, we'll be using the mitral valve inflow signal with post-wave Doppler, but we can also perform tissue Doppler of the mitral annulus, color M mode, flow propagation, and also post-wave Doppler of the pulmonary veins. We'll discuss later which modalities we use when and what the importance and relevance of each of these modalities is. But first we'll take a look at post-wave Doppler across the mitral valve to see which parameters we can derive with this modality. You already know how to perform a post-wave Doppler across the mitral valve. Here is the signal in our patient. Now we have E wave and an A wave. This is diastasis between E and A. And we can now perform a quantification of the velocities of the E wave and also the slope of the E wave to calculate the deceleration time and then the A wave. And then we get a number of different values. First of all, we have the E to A ratio, which is above 2. We'll discuss later why this is the case. And also the deceleration time. What kind of a diastolic function does he have? Well, he's a completely healthy co-worker of ours and he has a supranormal diastolic function uh, where he sucks the blood into the left ventricle very vigorously. So here are the different parameters we can assess with the post-wave Doppler. The isovolumetric relaxation time, deceleration time, A duration and the E to A ratio. You can see that the normal values vary with respect to age. The next modality I would like to discuss is tissue Doppler specifically tissue Doppler of the mitral valve annulus. In principle, you have two possibilities to assess the velocity of the uh, mitral annular plane, either at the medial vicinity or at the lateral vicinity. So I'll first show you how to do it at the medial uh, portion of the mitral valve ring. The first thing is we try to get the spectrum as small as possible to enhance or increase your frame rate. Then you put the color Doppler, uh, the tissue Doppler spectrum over the medial annulus. And then you put the post wave Doppler signal right at the area where the, the ring is. And you will receive a spectrum which looks like this. What can you see? First of all, you see systole here. And you see diastole here. This is the E wave and this is the A wave. What you would need for the E to E prime ratio is this velocity. In this case it would be uh, 0.12. So he had a um, normal E velocity of something in the range of uh, 6 or 7. So it, the ratio would be somewhere in the range of 5 to 7 would be his normal E to E ratio. You can also perform the measurement at the lateral ring. All you have to do is switch the region of interest to the lateral ring, then put the post-wave Doppler signal there. And again, we get an E wave or E prime wave and an A prime wave. Here, the maximum velocity is 0.18. So you will usually see a much higher a higher velocity uh, of the uh, tissue Doppler E prime wave with the lateral ring opposed to the medial ring. These are now the normal values for the tissue Doppler of the mitral valve annulus. You can see the septal E prime decreases with age just as the lateral E wave does. You will also find these values in your fact sheets. The next modality I'll talk about is flow propagation, which is a combination of M mode and color Doppler. For the flow propagation, all you need is a four-chamber view and you would then place the color Doppler signal across the mitral valve and 
reduce the pulse repetition frequency a bit and then put the M mode across the mitral valve and thereby get a spectrum which looks something like this. And the steepness of this curve here basically reflects diastolic function. The steeper the curve is, uh, the more, the quicker the inflow of the flow is, uh, and this allows you to draw conclusions about diastolic function or dysfunction. Finally, the last modality we'll discuss is pulmonic venous flow. So here's how I would do an assessment of the pulmonic veins. First of all, you need a four-chamber view, and you have to visualize the pulmonic veins, especially the right upper pulmonic vein, which is this structure here. And then I would first place the color Doppler and uh, just try to visualize the inflow. You can decrease the PRF, then you can see the low flow velocities of the pulmonic veins better. And then I use this as a reference to place my pulse wave Doppler sample right here at the origin of the pulmonic veins. And then you have a signal like this, where you should also bring down the filter, because if you have a high filter, you will not see anything. So bring down the filter so that you even see the low velocities. And usually the patient breathes and the signal is gone. Okay, but this would be uh, the signal now. So and what you see here now is you see the typical systolic component, the diastolic component, and the retrograde component of pulmonic venous flow. And finally, these are the normal values for pulmonary venous flow, for the systolic and diastolic component, for the AR component of the wave, and also for the duration of AR. Don't forget when you perform echocardiography that the 2D image alone provides valuable information with respect to diastolic function. Specifically, the size of the left atrium reflects elevated left atrial filling pressures and thereby diastolic dysfunction. Normally, the left atrium should be below 34 milliliters per square meter. So you see the physiology behind diastolic dysfunction is not that complicated. And even though we have four different modalities, we usually only use the mitral valve inflow and maybe the tissue Doppler of the mitral valve analyst.